Okay, we are recording. Alrighty, so we're gonna start with World War II today. Um, we're gonna try to kind of finish it up by the end of the week because I wanna move on. Um, I wanna do some more German language with you guys. And I wanna do some more geography based stuff with you guys instead of just history. So we are going to kind of read about the end of the war. We're going to wrap it up a little bit, okay? So remember we learned about the Battle of the Bulge. It happened in December of 1944 through the beginning of 1945. Um, remember Hitler had planned these massive panzer armies. What's a panzer? Um, the pan? Is it a big cat? It's no. A it's a panzer is a pan. the different ways that the tanks had evolved um, throughout the years. And so he made panzer armies of the fifth generation panzers and the sixth generation panzers. So basically top of the line tanks. The most modern top of the line tanks you can get. Hitler planned these armies. He plans to send a million Nazi soldiers to the front and they are going to win this thing, Hitler thinks. Do the generals, do the Nazi generals have a good outlook on this idea? Did they think it was a good idea? No. No. They but said, they, didn't have supplies. they said, we don't have enough supplies. They said, our guys are tired. The soldiers we have left are very, very young or very, very old. We don't have what we need to win this thing. We have been fighting for five years. We're tired. Terrible plan. Hitler said, do it. Right? Um, who is the American general who came in and saved the day? Remember, at first, they were winning. Things were going bad. They made a dent. They made a bulge in the Allied front. What's his name? He's a super famous general. General George Washington. Patton. Oh, general yeah. George Patton. When you're older, there is a movie called Patton. Um, I watched it in high school, but I didn't pay attention, but it's very famous. Is it Patton Tom? Okay, so General George Patton comes in and he says, we are ending this here and now, and he gets victory over the Nazi troops, and it definitely changes the outcome of the war. Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister from Great Britain, called it the greatest American victory in history. Okay, um, this is kind of backtracking, I think. Um, We'll just kind of go through this and kind of skim it. So, a few of the cities that were let me find a good place to start. Oh, we'll start with the end of the Battle of the Bulge. I guess that makes sense, doesn't it? Okay, so following their January victory at the Battle of the Bulge, the Allies continued their slog toward Germany. Their goal was to capture the west bank of the Rhine River and three strategic German cities, Cologne, Bonn, and Remag Remagen. 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 I don't know how they would say it. Um, Allied leaders agreed that while resistance would be fierce, enemy forces would not be able to stop this campaign, codenamed Lumberjack. What? Ooh, Lumberjack. So the Allies have now developed Lumberjack. This is after the Battle of the Bulge. They plan to capture three major German cities. The 21st Army Group, composed of British, Canadian, and American divisions, closed in on the Rhine in the north while the U.S. First Army headed for Cologne and Koblenz. In the face of opposition, the German military stood its ground. In an attempt to slow the Allied advance, Hitler ordered the bridges over the Rhine destroyed. So Adolf Hitler, to stop the Allies, 
ordered any bridge that crossed the Rhine River destroyed. That way the Allied troops could not cross the river easily. If they're carrying tanks over the bridges, then they probably would fall anyway. Yep. One of the few spans left intact was intact was the Lundendorf Bridge, 15 miles south of Bonn, which crossed the Rhine at the ancient Roman town of Remagen. Remagen. Named for General Erich Ludendorff, who had led the final German offenses in the Western Front during World War I, this strong railway bridge dominated the town and provided passage to retreating German soldiers and escaping refugees. So the bridge that's remaining over the Rhine was a railroad bridge. What does that mean? It means that trains. Yeah, it's a bridge for trains to cross. Why did Adolf Hitler and the Nazis decide they needed to keep one? Because they needed because the trains carried their people. Yeah, they needed a way to cross the river, right? So they needed a way to retreat. They needed an escape route. They also need an escape route for refugees, people who were running, basically. Um, on March 7th, the U.S. First Army began its advance to Remagen, led by Lieutenant Carl Timmerman, commander of Company A of the 27th Armored Infantry Battalion. Timmerman believed that the Germans, who were stationed on either side of the river, would destroy the Lindendorf before he arrived. But when the lieutenant put his field glasses to his eyes and looked toward the Rhine, he saw that the bridge was still standing. The Germans were planning to destroy the bridge as soon as their soldiers had crossed. Oh, so they get there just in the nick of time. The bridge is still up. It had not been destroyed yet. Around two Who ate it? Who ate it? Around 2 p.m., just as the Americans were about to advance towards the, towards the bridge, a dark torrent of earth, paving stones, and iron exploded on its western ramp. The Germans had blown a 30-foot crater in the railway leading to the bridge. Instead, the bridge was still standing. Two of Timmerman's men raced up the girders to cut the wires leading to the remaining German demolition chargers, while the rest of Timmerman's men fought their way to the other side. So they are crossing as the Nazis are trying to blow up this bridge. So they have a big hole now in the railway, and they are going, and they're, so they're using like dynamite explosives that's connected to a cord. Like, oh, detonate it. But so it's not like wireless like we have today. Now you just have this button, you can push it, you know. But so it was attached to a cord, so they go and they snip the wire so they can't blow up, they can't use their detonator. Before the German captain in charge of the Nazi effort surrendered, he sent this message to his superiors. The demolition of the bridge was unsuccessful. The Americans have crossed. The capture of the Lundendorf, dubbed the Miracle of Remagen, allowed Allied armies to stream across the river. Within the first 24 hours, more than 8,000 soldiers had passed over the last natural barrier to Germany's heartland. Oh yeah. So here is a picture of um, U.S. Army engineers there working to repair the damage to the Lindendorf Bridge after um, they had tried to destroy it. And the other picture, the one in color, you can see American flags on the top. And this is where um, the Americans put the U.S. flags um, on the tower of the Lindendorf Bridge after they captured it. So another victory for the Allies. Please take your feet off the table. Yeah. Operation Lumberjack. Was Operation Lumberjack a success? No. Oh. Yes! It was? Yes. But they couldn't work. To the Germans. Operation Lumberjack was an Allied operation. Wait, I thought it was just a code name. It 
is, but it was a success because the Allies got into Germany across the Rhine. It was a plan for the Allies, not the Germans. Okay, so now we've got We've got Allied forces in the heartland of Germany, which means inside, infiltrating. They don't have any natural barriers around them, such as the river, the mountains. They are actually, like, in. Okay, so now we're going to talk about a city named Dresden. Dresden is in northern Germany. And, um... Actually, we know somebody who lives just outside of Dresden. Me and Camden do, anyway. Camden probably won't remember because Camden was a tiny baby when Miss Lydia was his teacher. Um, she is one of my good friends that um, our husbands used to work together, and they live just outside of Dresden in northern Germany. And for a while, they lived here, and Miss Lydia worked here in the nursery, and Camden was just a tiny baby. The northern German city of Dresden, nicknamed the Florence of the Elbe River, was filled with museums and historic buildings that dated from medieval times. Because it had not been a military target in the early years of the war, Dresden escaped the fire bombings that decimated other German cities, and it became a magnet for refugees fleeing the advancing Red Army. Who's the Red Army? Lobsterbacks. Russia? Not the Lobsterbacks. The Lobsterbacks were the British Army. The Red Army would be from Russia, yes. So Dresden was not a main military city for Germany, so nobody really bothered with it. Now that Dresden is left intact and Dresden has not been bombed or attacked, we've got refugees who are looking for somewhere safe. Here, listen, put it back. Neither of you need that. Give it to me. Um, we've got refugees trying to escape and find somewhere safe, they're going to Dresden. By February 1945, Dresden was teeming with people, far more than the city's official population. Over the next 48 hours, an estimated 135,000 would be killed. The greatest loss of civilian life of all Allied bombing raids during the war. The campaign, which was conducted by 800 American and British aircrafts, unleashed more than 3,400 tons of explosives on the beleaguered city. Incendiary bombs ignited a firestorm that burned for days and destroyed eight square miles. Some citizens were lucky enough to escape the inferno and ended up with only burned feet. A few people tried to find refuge in the city's reservoirs only to drown. A reservoir is like an underground water system. So think about like our city water sewage system. But the reservoir would hold like not toilet water, regular water, it collects rainwater and things like that. I'd rather be in that toilet Those hospitals left standing were overwhelmed with the inju injured. Why was Dresden targeted so late in the war? Does anyone know why they might have done this? Um, it's expected. It would be a surprise. Some argue that Dresden was a major communication center and destroying the city prevented the German army from sending messages. Dresden may have been selected because Churchill and Roosevelt had promised Russian Premier Joseph Stalin that they would bomb Eastern Germany. Or the city may have been chosen to warn Stalin not to stray from the agreements made earlier in the war. The United States and Britain hoped that their display of fearsome firepower would discourage the ambitious Russian leader. So there's only kind of theories as to why. One would be that it was a, a way, a communication center, and they wanted to cut off that communication. Another one was that the leader of Russia, Joseph Stalin, was making Germany and, or, um, Britain and America very nervous, um, thinking that he might turn against them, and they wanted to show their strength and show them what, what they could do to um, make him not want to turn against the other allies.
There's also a really good book about, I think it's about the bombing of Dresden. It's called Slaughterhouse Five. All right, next we capture Hanover. The road through the heart of Germany was paved with bombed out buildings and ruined cities. The result of repeated aerial assaults. That means assaults from the air, planes dropping bombs. One of the hardest hit metropolitan areas was Hanover, an important railroad junction and industrial center. The British had begun their missions over the city during the summer of 1941, attacking rail yards, oil refineries, metal works, and other strategic targets. In September 1943, the Allies dropped over 2,100 tons of bombs on Hanover, followed by another 1,600 tons in October of that year. Still, the Allies were not done. In January 1945, they blanketed the city with 2,300 more tons of explosives. The raids left 90% of the inner city in ruins. Residential areas were nearly obliterated and some 6,000 civilians were killed. Then, Nuremberg Falls show you this picture. So I visited Nuremberg while I lived in Germany and um, one of the really cool parts, so pretty much Nuremberg gets demolished. It's another air raid, aerial bomb. They attack Nuremberg. Nuremberg is blown to smithereens basically. So all of the town people, of course they have to go somewhere when the bomb is coming. One of the places that they would hide were in the underground reservoir. Um, and then, um, so we got to go into one of those underground bomb shelters. It was a giant, absolutely huge. And they still have things down there, relics left from World War II. What was the, um, what was the bridge? It was a bridge across the river to get into Germany. Oh. Um, where, uh, I mean, what was in the bomb shelter? When, was there like beds in it? Uh, no, not all of them. There's a bomb shelter behind my house. There were some toys left down there though. What? Berlin may have been the political center of Nazism, but Nuremberg was its spiritual hub. A city with historical ties to the Holy Roman Empire, Nuremberg was chosen by Nazi officials to host the party's annual rally, a ritualized spectacle designed to energize the faithful. The rallies became so huge that Albert Speer, the Third Reich's chief architect, designed a vast complex of buildings and parade grounds dubbed Zeppelin Field on the edge of the city to accommodate the crowds. I have been to Zeppelin Field. Um, they have left, they've torn down most of it, and now it's a racetrack. But they still have the big building and stand where Adolf Hitler stood and led the rally. Um, so pictures that you see, some of the most famous pictures that you see of Adolf Hitler were taken at Zeppelin Field. Um, let me see if I can find it, because you've probably seen it before. Um, Well, here it is. So, of course, they took the big swastika down that's on the top, but the big, the concrete building you're going to see, um, this is called the Tart Still Sam. So, I've stood up here. Um, and then they have a, like a race car track on there now. This is that one. heavy
bloodiest rounds of bombing by Allied planes. Um, in January, nearly 2,000 people were, kill were killed in just one hour. In February, another bombing raid killed another 1,000. In fact, about 6,000 residents of the cities lost their lives in air raids, in air raids and 100,000 were left homeless. Oh. Um, Nuremberg was rebuilt, and they tried, um, while they were rebuilding, everything has kind of been rebuilt and restored to look how it originally did. Then we have the fall of Berchtesgaden. I've also been to Berchtesgaden. Berchtesgaden is in Bavaria, down by Munich, close to Austria. Yeah, um, Berchtesgaden is a beautiful, tiny town, and the only reason that it had anything to do with the Nazis is because of this building right here. This building right here is called Eagle's Nest. I've been there. It has a beautiful view from the very top of the German Alps. And the road to get there, you have to ride this little bus up from the parking lot, and the road is like this big, and it's terrifying because you look out the window and you're, it's a straight down cliff off of the Alps. But we survived the ride and made it to the top, and then you get in this elevator and it takes you all the way up. Now it is a little restaurant up there, and you can just kind of walk around and see the view. Um, there's not really much to do up there, but it's called Eagle's Nest. Eagle's Nest was one of Hitler's homes. It was built for him for his 50th birthday. And so um, this was another town, of course, that got destroyed. I wonder if anyone has friends or whatever that is saying the real All right, and then in April, in April, the Allies free the Netherlands. I'm going to kind of rush through a little bit more. Then the Allies move into northern Italy. Remember, Italy was one of the Axis powers. Um, and um, the Allies were able to get into Italy further or earlier in the war than they were into Germany. So then they go there. The final days in the Führer bunker. The Führer, remember, is Adolf Hitler. He is the leader. In January 1945, Hitler re relocated to Berlin and took refuge in the Führer bunker, a self-sufficient underground air raid shelter that had 18 rooms and its own water and electrical supply. So he knows this war is coming to a close. The Allies are taking out everything. They're bombing cities. He knows he's done for, and he knows that if the Allies get their hands on him, he's going to be in a world of trouble, right? Because remember, they're free concentration camps. They're finding out all of the war crimes that Germany has committed, and they are whipping people into shape, basically, girls. So Adolf Hitler tucks tail and runs. He runs and hides out. When Hitler first moved to the Führer bunker, his days followed a certain pattern. In the afternoon, he came to an undamaged wing of the Chancellery building where he consulted with his top military advisors. Following these meetings, he had tea with the secretaries and other officials. He then retreated underground and spent the nights in the bunker. This routine soon gave way to another. Hitler emerged to take his dog um, on short walks. The rest of the time he spent underground uh, in March, so about three months he's been down there uh, amidst, amidst desperate last-ditch fighting with the Allies closing in on Berlin, Hitler oh, issued this order. Hey, stop! He's, Lee's not doing anything. He's fine. He says, all military transport and communication facilities, industrial establishment and supply depots, as well as anything else of value within Reich territory, which could in any way be used by the enemy immediately or within the foreseeable future, will be destroyed. So he orders them to destroy everything. Cover up the evidence. Well, people might know, but if they don't have evidence. Oh, so like destroy the evidence. Destroy the evidence. Oh. Hitler demanded that.
that Albert Speer, Minister of Armaments and War Production and the primary planner of the country's war economy, oversee the destruction. Speer refused to obey what has become known as the Nero Decree, believing that the German people would need the infrastructure and supplies after the war. Speer was able to persuade generals to ignore the order. Soon thereafter, he traveled to Berlin and told Hitler of his actions. By that time, it was too late to counterman Speer's decision, and as a result, at least some of Germany's industrial base survived the war. So one of them say, no, that's insane, we're not doing it, and he got people on his side. By that time, it was too late. Okay, let's see. By the 27th, Berlin had lost all secure radio communications and the staff that remained in the bunker were forced to rely on telephone lines to send instructions. Events progressed quickly and public radio became the main source of news and information in the war. So now they're in the bunker. Pretty much all their communication has been cut off. They can listen to the radio. They can make a phone call. That's it. On the 28th, Hitler learned that Himmler, head of the SS, had been trying to arrange surrender terms, and Hitler ordered Himmler's arrest. The next day, when Hitler was told of Mussolini's capture and killing in Italy, Mussolini, remember, was the dictator in Italy, so the Allies capture Mussolini, kill him. Um, when he learned of that, the Fuhrer vowed he would never become a similar spectacle. On the 29th at 4 a.m., Hitler signed his will in which he stated that he chose suicide as a capture and that he wanted his body to be burned at the chancellery. To ensure the cyanide pills that the SS had given him were effective, he tested one on his dog. On April 30th, Hitler was informed that Berlin would fall before the day had ended that afternoon, Hitler and Braun went into his study and killed themselves. Braun bit into one of the cyanide pills and died. Several minutes later, Hitler shot himself in the head. Where are they go outside? So, Hitler knows he's done for, there's nothing more he can do, so him and one of his trusted advisors commit suicide together. And then the war is over! Um, of course, it took for many, many months, um, many, many years to rebuild. The Allies are still freeing people from the concentration camps. They're helping to rebuild the cities. They're helping to um, clean up. They're helping to get a go the government back to democracy, back to a place where they can be independent again. Because right now, they've just come from a whirlwind of having this terrible dictator who is psycho. And so now, um, the Allies didn't just say, bye, see ya. They stuck around and they helped out. And they helped, um, they helped the countries get back on their feet. So, of course, we still have, um, of course, that was just kind of a, in a nutshell, trying to finish off. Um, and we never finished about Japan. So, of course, we still fought Japan. We had troops over in the Pacific Front as well. Um, one of the most famous bombings there was the bombing of Hiroshima where they dropped the atomic bomb. Two. Two atomic bombs on Hiroshima. Um, the chronology of the, so in January, January 27th, they liberate Auschwitz. April 11th, they liberate Buchenwald. They liberate Bergen-Belsen on April 15th. Dachau, remember Dachau was the first. They liberate it on April 29th. Um, Neuengamme on May 4th. May 8th, Dreisenstadt. They transform Dachau into what it is today. And... Um, And there we go. So the war has ended in Europe. We celebrate. We have VE Day in the British Commonwealth. Victory Day. Our allies are celebrating. We have Victory Day in France. We have Victory Day in the United States. We have Victory Day in the United States. We have Victory Day in Moscow. In Russia. We have a 
Operation Magic Carpet. <laughs> Operation, Mag Operation Magic Carpet was the operation to bring everybody back home. So getting troops back home was Operation Magic Carpet. When they were on the Magic Carpet, they go, a whole new world. Um, then we have the partition of Germany. Germany becomes divided into East and West Germany, which would remain divided until, what was it, the 1980s, right? Then they start trying Nazis for war crimes. Um, and a lot of them escaped. Many Nazis actually escaped out of the country. They came to the United States and basically changed their identities. Um, so it was, it's pretty interesting actually. All right, so that is where we're going to stop with World War II. I'm yeah. sure you will do a much more in-depth study of it later in your lives, in high school and college and or on your own. Um, if you have questions about World War II, you can always do research projects on it. Okay, um, so we're going to go back to Romeo and Juliet. We're going to go back to Romeo and Juliet, and um, remember, we're in Act 3, and Act 3 is what you need to know for your Friday morning work, okay? So Act 3 starts with Romeo's battle, and Mercutio, Mercutio dies, Romeo freaks out and kills Tybalt. Remember, either thou or I or both must go with him. So Romeo kills Tybalt. Uh, Prince Aeschylus says because he was provoked, he didn't start the fight, I won't kill him, but he's banished. He's kicked out of Verona for eternity. So he goes to see Friar Lawrence. Friar Lawrence says, ha see Juliet for the last time. I'll try to get this worked out. You're going to move to Mantua outside of Verona and wait for my messenger. Okay? Juliet stared at her. Your father wants you to marry Count Paris this Thursday. Isn't that great news? No. <laughs> what does her mother not know? She's married, she's to, married to someone else. How could she marry Count Paris? If she's already married. <laughs> Juliet was horrified. No, I won't marry him. But then her father who had been waiting outside, came into the room with the nurse. What do you mean no, he roared. You'll be married on Thursday and that's that. That's it. You must be upset about Tybalt, said her mother, but the wedding is sure to cheer you up. They left Juliet sobbing in her nurse's arms. No, <laughs> she wailed. Oh, sweetie, perhaps you should marry the Count after all, the nurse said. I will not, Juliet said determinedly through her tears. I'm going to see the friar. Old Capulet had already told Friar Lawrence he would need his services for his daughter's wedding on Thursday. So when the friar saw Juliet coming, he knew why. I'm so sorry, Juliet, he said kindly. I've heard all about your father's plans. I'll kill myself, Juliet threatened. I'd rather do that than marry Paris. No, wait, said Friar Lawrence. There's another thing that just might work. I have an herbal potion that will send you to sleep for two days. Such a deep sleep that you'll seem to be dead. If you take it tonight, your family will think you've died and they'll put your body in the Capulet vault. I will send word to Romeo to come and collect you when you wake up, and then you can run away to Mantua together. Give me the bottle, said Juliet. I'll do it. And thank you, Friar Lawrence. 
She went home, apologized to her parents, and told them she would marry Paris. Then she went to her room, took a deep breath, and swallowed every last drop of the potion. The next morning, the Capulet household was plunged into weeping and despair. Juliet had been found dead in her bed. The wedding was called off and a funeral arranged. When everyone had wept over her and kissed her and blessed her soul, Juliet was carried down to the icy cold vault beneath the Capulet Chapel until her funeral could be held. Meanwhile, Friar Lawrence sent a messenger to Mantua with a letter for Romeo, explaining the plan. But Romeo's friends, unaware of the truth, had already sent a servant to Mantua to tell him of Juliet's death. When he received the terrible news, Romeo finally gave in to despair. Well, Juliet, I will be with you soon after all, he said to himself. I'll buy some poison and come back to Verona and join you in the Capulet vault, and there I will lie down beside you and end my life. He left his lodgings and went to find the best apothecary in Mantua to ask him for the deadliest poison money could buy. Why is the poison he used though? Because he thinks Juliet's dead and how can you live without Juliet who he's known for two days? <laughs> Camden. <laughs> arrived with the letter, there was no sign of Romeo. He was already on his way back to Verona. The messenger searched all over Mantua for him and went home to tell Friar Lawrence he had been unable to deliver the letter. Oh no, Friar Lawrence excl exclaimed, that letter was very important. Oh dear, oh dear, I must go to the vault and rescue Juliet myself. I'll hide her at my house until I can fetch Romeo and he ran from his house, heading for the Capulet vault. At that moment, Romeo had just arrived in the vault. To his horror, Count Paris was there. He had come to say farewell to Juliet and was leaning over her body, stroking her hair. When he saw Romeo, he looked furious. Romeo Montague, he snarled. You're responsible for all this. You killed Tybalt and now poor Juliet has died of grief for him. You're wrong, said Romeo. Get out of my way. Stay away from her, shouted Paris, and both men drew their daggers. Paris was older and stronger, but Romeo was more determined. Pinning Paris to the wall, he stabbed him in the stomach. As he slumped to the floor, Romeo ran to the marble plinth where Juliet lay, threw his arms around her and kissed her. Then he took the bottle of poison from his pocket and drank it down. I love you, Juliet he whispered. Seconds later, he lay dead beside her. Oh no, oh dear, Bryant Lawrence panted to himself as he sprinted down the street. Juliet moved. Her eyes opened. She was awake. Looking around her, she saw the cold, dark vault and knew the plan had worked. Then she sat up and saw Romeo. Romeo, she cried. She shook him. Then she saw the bottle of poison and realized what had happened. Romeo, she gasped in horror. Oh, Romeo, my love, I'll never be parted from you. And she pulled his blood-stained dagger from its sheath and stabbed herself in the heart. Ugh. Friar Lawrence arrived too late. He raised the alarm at once, but Romeo and Juliet were already dead. When Prince Aeschylus heard what had happened, he declared, decreed that the young lovers must be given a joint funeral and buried side by side. Let this tragedy be a lesson to both your families, the prince told the Capulets and the Montagues. It is now time to end your feud and live in peace and harmony so that I shall never again have to hear a tale as tragic as that of Juliet and her Romeo. Is it over? Comedy, history, or tragedy? Tragedy. Tragedy. Tragic love. <laughs> and so I'm going to read you the dying scene. And I believe all of this is act three. So the time from when Mercutio and Tybalt dies until Romeo and Ju Juliet die. 
is all accurate. Yay! Um,